The plan is really for each of the panelists to speak for a few minutes, and then I have a few questions, and I hope you all will have questions from the audience as well. So um, why don't we, oh, well, let me introduce you first. So I'm not going to read the bios, which are in your handout, but to my immediate right is Jackie Martinez from the New York Botanical Garden. And next to her is Wayma Harris from the Brooklyn Children's Museum. Lisa Carling is here from the Theater Development Fund. And Frank Vignon is here from the Historic House Trust. So, um, Jackie, would you like to start us off and, and tell us a little bit about the Botanical Garden? Sure. So, um, thank you so much, um, Francesca, for um, inviting me to be on this panel. I feel very honored. So um, I am the Associate Vice President um, for Human Resources and Administration at the New York Botanical Garden. And uh, I've been the ADA coordinator since 2005. Um, I kind of stumbled into it. Um, I'm sure many of you can relate to that. And um, Francesca helped pick me up <laughs> and was very helpful in getting me kind of jump-started um, into accessibility, um, which now I, I'm very passionate about. So um, in case you're not familiar with the New York Botanical Garden, um, we're located in the Bronx. Um, we're situated on 250 acres, and it is one of the few cultural institutions that is primarily outdoors. So if you can imagine, um, you know, it is very challenging um, to make a natural landscape um, as accessible as possible, um, both indoors and outdoors. Um, but we have learned through the process that it truly is a collaborative effort um, between the staff, uh, disability advocates, um, people with disabilities, and also ADA experts. I purposely did not bring a PowerPoint presentation because I want you to all use your senses in imagining how beautiful the New York Botanical Garden is. <laughs> and I also hope that after I've described some of our uh, gardens that you will actually come and visit us. So as I mentioned before, um, due to the garden's um, naturally varied topography, um, it presents you know, a number of challenges. It makes it almost impossible um, to uh, make this historic landscape fully accessible. Um, however, we strive um, to provide as much access as possible um, to all of our outdoor areas and to our specialty gardens and exhibitions. So in thinking about um, how we work with the challenges that we face um, with a natural landscape, um, we try to look at how programmatic changes um, can assist us with more effectively communicating what those challenges are or might be uh, while still trying to provide um, a quality experience. So I would like to highlight some of the examples um, in which we've tried to achieve this. So one area um, is the home gardening center. Um, it's a specialty garden that's designed for the everyday gardener. Um, this garden includes trial beds um, for people um, to learn more about what kinds of plants um, they can plant in their own gardens. Uh, we have a cutting garden, a vegetable garden. Uh, we, th we actually thought this would be a perfect location um, to include a sensory garden, um, which we've called Helen's Garden for the Senses. Mm -hmm. And this particular garden includes low planting beds um, to accommodate wheelchair users. Um, and plants that help stimulate the, the senses by touch and by smell. Um, we also have a, an accompanying audio tour called um, Stimulating Your Senses um, that includes visually descriptive commentary uh, designed for the garden's visitors who are blind or lo have low vision. Um, our audio tour um, signage also includes braille text as you go through the garden. Uh, we also have the Thane Family Forest, um, which is a 50-acre forest um, that is in what we call the heart of the New York Botanical Garden. When the forest was renovated in November of 2011, um, the planning process um, included making a dedicated pathway uh, through selected areas of the forest uh, that was accessible, as accessible as possible. Um, this pathway enables visitors who use wheelchairs or have baby carriages to capture the essence of its allure um, and experience the feel of this natural woodland as well as the sights and sounds of the nearby um, Bronx River. So uh, am I enticing you yet? <laughs> I hope I am. This week we're very excited because we have the um, restoration of our native plant garden. Um, it's a historic uh, reopening for the New York Botanical Garden 
And during the design phase um, of this particular garden, we looked at what features could be included to make it the most accessible garden within uh, all of our specialty gardens. So we created a garden that features a fully accessible pathway using uh, gravel lock soil stabilization technology, um, which is very aesthetically um, natural and also creates a very accessible path. Um, we also install, installed assistive, uh, an assistive listening system in our education pavilion um, that enables hearing aid users to wires, wirelessly um, connect um, to its sound system. Uh, since the best way to see 250 acres um, is through a tram tour, uh, we made each tram wheelchair accessible and installed T-coil compatible induction loop systems um, with accompanying headsets. <clears throat> uh, we also recently installed induction loops in all of our ticket windows um, because accessibility needs to begin actually from before the moment um, the visitor comes uh, or steps foot into our facility. So, um, regarding the programming, um, the garden's primary exhibition house is located in the Enid A. Howe Conservatory. If you haven't seen it, it's a beautiful Victorian glass house um, that was built in 1895 um, that is accessible. However, um, some of the paths in the conservatory tend to be a little narrow, um, and so we obtain ass assistive listening devices uh, in order for our visitors to hear the tour guides uh, more clearly. Um, we installed an infrared loop system in our lecture hall um, to accommodate visitors who come to our performances. Um, we also give visitors an option of dialing into our cell phone tours um, for a more educational experience. And we offer a tour of a garden collection with a, an American Sign Language interpreter every third Saturday of the month. Now, in looking towards the future, um, it is crucial that accessibility begin in the design phase um, per, particularly for any new construction. Um, the design for uh, the a Edible Academy, um, which is going to be uh, a facility, a gardening facility for children that is indoor and outdoor, we're very excited about it, um, because it will allow us to teach children about garden, gardening year round. Um, it's scheduled to open in 2015 and will be a fully accessible gardening facility that includes um, induction loops in its educational areas, um, accessible paths, and also restrooms. Um, this rings true for programs and exhibitions that need to be planned. Uh, we have an accessibility committee that gathers frequently to identify the needs of our visitors and plan appropriately. We also appreciate when our visitors provide us with the feedback um, regarding their experience because it allows us to continue um, providing quality programs um, for all who visit. Um, for the New York Botanical Garden, um, accessibility is an ongoing education um, on what its visitors want and need um, to enjoy the magnific magnificent landscapes and gardens. Uh, most of the time, I feel we are successful um, and sometimes we have to try again. But accessibility for our visitors is an important issue um, for all of our staff, and it is uh, truly a team effort. Uh, despite the financial setbacks that all cu cultural institutions have faced, um, particularly within the last few years, uh, our, our visitation has actually continued to increase uh, or increasingly grow um, as we continue to adapt to our changing visitation. Um, we have learned many lessons um, in our quest to learn and educate ourselves. Um, but an important one is that when you listen and give your audience what it wants and needs, they will keep coming back, and more importantly, they keep coming back with company. <laughs> uh, and lastly, uh, a good experience is the best and most positive press um, your organization can ever get. Well Thank said. <laughs> and now on to Wema. I believe we have a PowerPoint we for do. you, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. I am Wayma Harris. I'm a museum educator, and I'm also the Access Programs Coordinator at Brooklyn Children's Museum. I also worked as the project director on the sensory room at Brooklyn Children's Museum, which I'm going to pretty much go into a little bit of detail about that kind of process of going through this process of developing our sensory room at the museum. So let's see. There we go. All right. So if you've never visited Brooklyn Children's Museum, we are at uh, 
145 Brooklyn Avenue in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Um, it's actually only a 10 minute walk from my house, which is wonderful <laughs> um, because I've traveled, traveled, traveled throughout. I've grown up in New York, so I, I've always worked all over New York City. So it's a nice thing to have a place um, as beautiful as Brooklyn Children's Museum close to home. But we are also the oldest children's museum in the world. It was built in 1899. And um, we continue to be an innovative institution um, because we're the first children's museum that specifically developed a sensory room for children with autism and um, sensory integration disorders. Okay. So being an inclusive space. Now, if anyone has ever visited Brooklyn Children's Museum, it's, it's a space I, I always uh, ask our children when they first come in, you know, can you touch things at Brooklyn Children's Museum? And I look at them like this, and they're kind of like, <laughs> and then I say, yes, yes, you can touch things. You can touch almost everything here. Um, it's very touchable, very tactile, um, very sensory driven throughout the entire museum. But we also want to make sure that our visitors that can be overstimulated sometime have a space that is inclusive and that feels um, like they belong. And so um, we went into this process of developing our sensory room and making it an inclusive community, just like our entire museum is. And just briefly about some other things that we've done in the museum to um, work with this accessibility, is that we look at bringing in community partners. It's so vital that you look at your community and you try to be a, become a beacon for that. And um, we've worked with the League School for over 20 years and actually have brought in students, teenagers that work as volunteers and give them job opportunities to get into the work environment. Um, so these are all children um, and young people with disabilities that have the opportunity to get work experience and work in our museum and also the Brooklyn Transition Center and several other things. But um, this, this was something that we looked at when we first thought about building our sensory room. How can we engage with our community? Um, great. So one thing that I thought about um, first is that this collaborative process is so important. I spoke with the president of our museum um, at the time, Georgina Ngozi, and also our um, wonderful funder. I had this conversation, and what he said was, I want to make sure that the space is one where children feel engaged, but you know, it's not just like this space on the side just for them, that it's inclusive so the entire community feels welcome. And the only way that we went through that is to really look at collaboration. And that collaboration happened through our sensory advisory committee, which met monthly. Every single month we came together and discussed and argued and talked and thought about ways to really, really make the space not only, the, the difficulty with sensory rooms, uh, let me just say, is that there, there are two needs. There are multiple needs. There are so many needs. And the thing is that you want to look at whether your space is engaging and that um, it's stimulating or that it's a calming experience. And many children have many different needs. And we had to figure out, OK, well, is our space calming? Is our space stimulating? Can we do both? And the Big thing, the big decision, we came together with our sensory advisory committee, which consisted of parents, um, uh, educators in the community, occupational therapists, physical therapists. Uh, we really came together and decided we really want the space to do both. And how can we make this space adapt to meet the needs of the children? And um, so we did that through collaboration, sensory advisory committee, the um, exhibits department, collections department, as well as the education department. Um, and not only that, obviously going out and seeing other spaces that exist outside of um, our community to see what we could bring into our sensory room. Um, what you see featured here is our um, sensory snake. And um, it's one of the major features inside of our room. Um, because it, it shows, I guess, the collaboration process um, at its best. 
really bringing in the exhibits department and the collections department and bringing in our beautiful collection, which is over 30,000 pieces in our collection, and actually bringing some of those things out to be exhibited um, in our room, having a beautiful wind chime, which you know has this very light and very beautiful sound when you come past it. I actually um, put my finger through the wind chime when a child actually jumps and does something really exciting, and then they get the wind chime, and it's like, oh. I, you know, so it's, it's a really fun process. Um, if you see on the side, let me see if I can work this pointer. Ooh, I can. All right, wonderful. All right, so right here we have um, some beautiful, beautiful shells. But right next to it, I know you can't really identify this until you visit the Brooklyn Children's Museum, which I know you will. Um, but this texture is created to actually match the shell right over here. So I asked them, which, do you, which of these shells do you think actually feels like this? So it's really interesting to think about things that we can't touch, but also have things that you can and um, enable them to have this multiple sensory experience. But I have to say, my favorite thing on the sensory snake is right here. <laughs> These, these two little black boxes are actually heat-sensitive material. So when you touch it, it changes colors. Oh. And, um, and when it changes colors, it matches the insects inside the case. Oh. So um, the collaborative process in, in museum making, um, creating this space was so important that the entire museum came together to say this is important and this is vital. But why did we do it? Why did we decide to, to put the sensory room together? We, f we found out that there was a need in our community, and that happened through a very, very adamant parent that said, you know what, my son Luke is 12 years old, and he can only be in tots because that's the only space that he feels comfortable in. What can we do to help him? And this is what we did to help him. We saw that need, and she became part of our sensory advisory committee and um, very wonderfully helped to um, innovate the design that we talked about um, throughout this process. Okay, so now you can see some other features of the room. I talked a lot about adapting the space to meet the needs of the children. So we have some really, really great equipment inside the room where um, you can have stimulating, engaging activities, but also you can have like little hideaways and little getaway, uh, getaways. So, oops, sorry. I thought I was becoming an expert on this. Okay, here we go. All right, so right down here, um, it's almost like a little getaway with a little book, and you can hide inside these tunnels with this beautiful red cloth, and this cloth comes out sometimes and becomes a wave in the sensory room. The tunnels also turn over, and you can have a little rockin' and rollin' time, <laughs> which is always a, a, a big uh, point in the room. This one little girl came to me and said, when is rocking and rolling time? <laughs> because the tunnels were standing straight up next to each other, and it was like a little hideaway, and people were kind of playing around, and she just tugged on me and said, "When I said, it's right now. <laughs> it's right now. You just asked for it. And uh, this uh, last view right here kind of shows the, um, the room in its obstacle course kind of view, um, where a child can start right here on the bump, go across the wave, excuse me, the wave, um, walk across the tunnel and jump onto the big fluff chair, yes, and then come all the way back around and even kind of spin inside this little bump right here. Um, you don't see a really beautiful, great view of it, but this is probably one of the biggest um, features in our room, which is our swing. It's a hammock swing that si seats up to 300 pounds. Yes, you and your child <laughs> can hang out in our swing, and oh, we man. have many, many adults that do. All right. Um, I just want to give you a perspective of a parent that um, came to me and she was very, very happy with the room and, hey, I don't have to explain it. We'll, we'll read it through really quickly. I wanted to provide some feedback for my four-year-old son's experience in a sensory room at the Brooklyn Children's Museum. For background, one of the twins has been diagnosed with sensory integration disorder and does, in fact, attend a sensory gym three times each week. We have been early adopters coming to the room almost since its inception at the museum. In fact, we schedule our weekend visits to coincide with this room's open hours. Upon entering the museum, the twins race to the basement, 
On days when the room is crowded and there's a waiting time, they're quite disappointed. We often spend between 45 minutes to an hour in the room. We would welcome it if you could extend the open hours. <laughs> in any case, it has been a terrific addition to our twins' routine and extra reason to visit the museum. So if you wonder, like, hey, should we do something to really bring in um, something for our patrons that could stimulate them to come all the time? Yeah. Yeah, let's find it. Let's find it and let's bring it. And yes, we did extend our open hours. So in the summertime, um, first we were slated to only be open three times a week, and now we are slated to be open on four days a week, um, and hopefully much, much more. Obviously, it's all a part of funding. So any funders in here that want to bring more funding for our museum, we welcome that as well. And um, I'm very excited about uh, all the work that we do there. OK, this is our last slide. Um, and I, I just want to say a little bit about our programming. I'm obviously a museum educator, so I, I teach a lot of school programs and, and um, public programs. And one particular program that I decided in, in cre creating more initiatives inside of the sensory room is to have regular series of programming um, that are very uh, sensory in focus. So the first program that we had was minerals versus mush. And I was excited to just bring out our extra large minerals and have it viewed under black light and see the fluorescence, but also do that very direct contrast of creating our own mush in our space. And I'm just going to share one brief anecdote about a little boy about 14. Um, on the autism spectrum, and they read about this program and came to visit the program. And um, his caregiver said that, you know, he doesn't really like Play-Doh. He doesn't really, he's very averse to touch. And I said, okay, no problem. And um, we started our program. And the main thing we did at every single step was to talk about it, to look at it, to smell it, to touch each and everything that we did. And he touched the the, um, the flower, because it's just flower in the beginning. He touched the water. All of our children were going through the same experience. And by the time the dough was made, he was all hands in. He was all hands in. And it was a wonderful experience. They took the dough home with them, um, whatever they created. And um, all of those are little successes for us, um, because the families have, have gained so much by being a part of um, the accessibility programs that we have at the museum. And um, our next sensory um, program is coming up. It's called Watercolor Wonder, June 15th. Come out, come out. It's uh, going to be very beautiful. We'll have uh, beautiful wa um, rain on the walls, and you'll hear lots of different things. I don't want to give too much. You'll come out. I know you will. <laughs> All right. And um, thank you for um, watching our little PowerPoint. And please definitely come out to Brooklyn Children's Museum and visit us. Visit the whole museum, because I only gave you one little, like, mm -hmm. tiny piece, the, the sensory room. And there's so much more, our exhibits, our programs. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Wema. I, I love that both you and Jackie spoke about advisory boards of people with disabilities. And I just really want to highlight that because it's so important when you're bringing in people with disabilities and, and specialists um, and asking them their advice and their opinions, then you're really ensuring that whatever you're doing is, is going to be more successful. And um, you've also got a built-in audience. Right? You start up the programs, and they're going to come. And as you said, they're going to tell their friends, and they're going to tell their friends. So now, moving along to Lisa Carling from Theater Development Fund. Great to be here. Good morning. If any of you are not familiar with TDF, uh, there's a wealth of information on the website, www.tdf.org that explains why TDF has grown into the country's largest performing arts service organization. Uh, there's some wonderful programs that, that TDF has going for it. And it's a lot more than the red steps in Times Square, which are, have become a New York City icon. Accessibility is very much a part of TDF's mission. It's even in part of our statement to encourage and enable diverse audiences 
to attend live theater and dance. Of TDF's $14.6 million budget, $1.1 million is designated to support all the many accessibility programs that are within the access department, which I have the pleasure of running. I love it. There's so much to be done. When we were talking yesterday at the office, how have the accessibility programs impacted our organization? The first thing that came up was national resource. Uh, TDF has been providing accessibility services for 33 years for people with hearing, vision, mobility loss, and now most recently, children and adults on the autism spectrum. And as a result of that, history comes with responsibility. Uh, we find that theaters around the country are calling us to saying, how did you implement, implement your open captioning? How do you do your audio description? What type of equipment do you use? What are your ticket sales like? How do you market? So that's one way. Another way is New York State Council on the Arts has entrusted us with managing a, a grants program called TAP Plus which gives awards up to $5,000 to eligible arts organizations within New York State to support captioning, to help encourage uh, people who are hard of hearing or deaf to attend cultural events uh, in the state that are open to the public. And writing a good uh, grant proposal is crucial. You wouldn't believe how many Anyway, it's important. <laughs> yes, we would. Yes. Uh, another aspect of access accessibility programs at our organization is that it reminds our staff of our mission. Uh, any staff members who helped yesterday with our audio described performance of Annie for children in the tri state area who are blind or have low vision? Any staff members who helped with our wonderful autism-friendly performance of Spider-Man on Saturday at Foxwoods Theater see in practice the importance of, of what it means when you bring in diverse audiences, people who, who just don't have an opportunity to attend live theater the way typical audiences do. People take, take that for granted, but if you're dealing with a disability, the opportunities are rare, and it's important to, to open up live theater for us to a, a broad range of people with disabilities. I'd like to highlight one of our new access programs, TDF's Autism Theater Initiative, because it's new. And in all the years I've been doing access, it's sort of been increasingly there on the horizon, and now it's there, and there's an enormous audience out there, the autism community, and what are you doing to accommodate them? When, when you read that one in 88 children, one child in 88 is diagnosed as having some form of autism spectrum disorder, that's a staggering statistic. And it's not only the child or young adult with autism, it's the family, it's the siblings. Uh, it, we were uh, approached by special ed teachers and parents saying, what can you do? How can you make Broadway theater accessible to our children? And that, that sort of forced TDF to uh, think about this, to talk to psychologists, specialists in autism, special ed educators, more parents, and just design a, a, a program, the Autism Theater Initiative, that addressed that very large community. We have had somewhat um, of a challenge in funding for it. It's because, again, that it's so new, I think, on the accessibility horizon. And when we've appro approached foundations, corporations, to support autism-friendly performances, we hear time and time again, we do support, but we give it to Autism Speaks. And, and that is an example of a nationally recognized organization, very large, that reads autism to most corporations um, and foundations. So that's been a bit of a challenge. Uh, we are competing, so to speak, with uh, name recognition of, of 
a larger organization like that. I should backtrack a bit. There's tons of information about our autism theater initiative on www.tdf.org slash autism. But back in October 2011, TDF did the first ever autism-friendly performance of The Lion King on Broadway, and it was an unbelievable success. We documented how we did it. <clears throat> so this aspect of our accessibility programs, the Autism Theater Initiative, has become a model for best practices. So as an organization, institution, if you do something great, document it, and then it will become a model for other theaters or other institutions that want to do the same. We advised for the Hobby Center in Houston when they had the road tour of The Lion King in July, their first autism-friendly performance. We have advised Pittsburgh Cultural Trust in Pittsburgh. They're getting the road tour in September. And I had the pleasure of, it, of advising the Disney London office on their first autism-friendly performance of The Lion King on April 14th at the Lyceum Theater on the West End. And I even went to see it. I, and it was unbelievable and such a commonality in the autism community in terms of things that you would hear from, from families. Uh, uh, it, it's just such an effort that needs to be made. With our Autism Theater Initiative, we have found a wealth of new theater goers. Two years ago, we started out with a mailing list of 200, which has grown to 4,000. And these are 4,000 households. So that when we send out an e-blast for autism-friendly performances, you figure that it's a parent, child, a parent or a caregiver who will be ordering possibly four tickets. That's our average to bring the family to see an autism-friendly performance. I wanted to emphasize using local resources as we have modeled best practices with this program. It's important to take advantage in the case of autism, psychologists, advisors, volunteers in your community. That's what Pittsburgh is doing. That's what Houston did. That's what London did. They used the National Autistic Society. I guess a, a two parting thoughts I wanted to leave you with are that respond to the needs in your community. I, I think I touched on that with autism, that pay attention to where the potential audience is and where the need is. We're all here because we're interested in accessibility, but keep an open mind. You know, that, that there's so much more that, that can be done. And it's going to come from your consumers, your community. Where is the need? Where is the need for better access? The last thing I wanted to say was that uh, the impact of autism-friendly performances, again, using that as an example, it's, it's affecting not only the person with autism. We've seen, we've seen incredible things happen. Maybe. All right, my background is physical disabilities where you can measure you can measure the degree of disability. When you're dealing with cognitive or developmental disabilities, you can't. And anything can happen in that magic of a live theater experience. And I, to cite the Lion King, little boy, never affectionate with his sister, took her hand going down the escalator, leaving the Minskoff Theater or a little boy who did not want to be touched and never hugged anything, hugging a Simba Lion King doll under his arm on the train ride back home on, to Long Island. And, and that was a child, the mother wrote us, who didn't even stay through all of Act One. But for her, it was a success because he, he made it through part of the show. So it's not only impacting the child or adult with autism, but the whole family, the siblings. And beyond that, it's impacting the house staff, cast, production crew. It's a way of raising awareness. Autism is not a dirty word. Get it out there. Be proud. You've got a wonderful kid. And there's no need to tiptoe around calling it other things. At least that's our philosophy. It is with us. It's such, it's such a large and vibrant community. 
to Spider-Man on Saturday, and I hope I'm not giving away Spider-Man because there is more than one in the production. <laughs> uh, one on a landing pad up in the mezzanine was startled to be handed a note by a little boy, and he started tearing up in his mask, and then he went backstage. I don't know what was in the note, but whatever it was, he wrote a note back, and when he landed back on the mezzanine uh, landing pad, he handed his note to the little boy. Wonderful. And second, from Spider-Man, uh, another Spider-Man landed up in the balcony on a landing pad, high-fived a little boy who locked his fingers uh, with Spider-Man and again moved to tears. That In fact, the whole cast was. And they said they wished every audience could be that way because, boy, this... The audience was so engaged in what was happening. It was uh, an unbelievable experience. So I hope I've shared a little bit with you on the impact of accessibility. It can be amazing, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's something we all have to help in doing more of. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I think... It's so interesting what you're saying about family programs and how this, you know, what you're doing, you, you're thinking of your intended audience, but in fact you are impacting all the people involved in that person's life. And here at MoMA with our uh, program, sort of for older people, we're talking about the other end of the spectrum, um, for people with dementia, older adults, you know, we've had to rethink what family programs are because now we're talking about, you know, people coming here in their 70s and their 80s, also, you know, 50s and 60s, but with grown children that are bringing them here and they're experiencing, you know, art together. And so it's, it's just a, another, um, another way of thinking of family. So um, very quickly, sorry to, to, uh, to go on, but <laughs> from the historic house trust. Yep, let's pull it up. Great. My name is Frank Vignone. I'm executive director of the Historic House Trust for the City of New York. Uh, very quickly, we're an umbrella organization, public-private, that works with the City of New York and 23 Historic House Museum nonprofits that run the individual um, houses. And I have to say, when I was asked to be a part of this incredible um, discussion today, I kept insisting that you really don't need us. You don't want us. We're, we're such a kind of um, unusual case. Um, and so what, what they've asked me to do is kind of present what is unique about being a historic house museum because there are some things that really define how we deal with these issues of access. Um, but what I am going to talk about is stepping one, one place behind access in a way, and that is fundamentally rethinking what it means to be community and, and who actually come to our cultural institutions. Um, the things I'm going to talk about today have really been discussed not only in public presentations, but they've also been a part of um, um, schools and class projects. Um, unfortunately, I'm the bearer of bad news, not that I believe in this, um, but three out of four Americans have not visited any of our institutions um, in the last 10 years, and when they do, it's for entertainment purposes. And all you have to do is look at the pictures in that middle row and you see what they are doing, um, and the top row perhaps is what they're not doing. Um, the next slide, um, there's a 23% decline in attendance. Now, I know in New York City it's probably not that great, and many of us today have talked about how our attendance has increased. I'll be speaking specifically about historic house museums when, in fact, their attendance is being reflected by these numbers, and all you have to do is clearly look at historic house museums and other umbrella organizations dealing with larger historic preservation culturals. Um, and this was a number that was really fascinating to me. Out of 86,000 nationally designated historic sites, um, around 3% significantly represent minority interests. And by minority interests, of course, all we have to do is look at those images. And we're not necessarily just talking about physical or cognitive disabilities. We're talking about um, race and also all of the other um, issues involved with um, disabilities. Um, there are roughly around 15,000 historic house museums in all of the United States. Um, and the thing for us to keep um, aware of is that these house museums, on average, 
have an annual operating budget of around seventy to a hundred thousand dollars. So when we talk about these issues of inclusion and diversity and programming, we're dealing with really small culturals. So that's where I'm coming from is, is a kind of um, voice of, um, and you'll see anarchy about this. Um, one of the classes that we teach um, about studying historic house museums, um, we asked our students to go to a historic house museum and track excitement, imagination, and energy and take a look at these arrows and then just take a look at what they're looking at when they look at those arrows, and what you'll find is what traditionally historic house museums present and the way that they present it actually gets the lowest marks. And so this was, this was a kind of heads up for us that we're not just talking about kind of special communities, we're really talking about community as a whole. And so what we also realized is that the very nature of a historic house museum um, has in it just environmental obstacles. And on the other end, we have communication and cognitive obstacles. If you go to historic house museums, it's usually a guided tour, it's verbal, or they may have something written. There's very little in between the two. And so just by the traditional nature of a historic house museum, it makes it difficult to adapt to not only um, constituents with disabilities, but a larger community. And so this is where the anarchy comes in. The Historic House Trust has really been looking at a holistic deconstruction of what it means to be a historic house museum and a cultural institution. And, and instead of thinking about things as a museum, we're much more interested in looking at those cultural institutions, i.e. historic houses, as places of habitation. And that notion of habitation is not just about how we live in it, but it's a lot of different issues, and I'm going to show you where that kind of leads us to. Um, there are four parts to this anarchist guide, and the reason why it's valuable today is um, it, it touches on all of the things we're talking about. Surprise, surprise. Everything that's good for this constituency today is good for the rest of the world. And everything that's not so great for the rest of the world is probably not so great for this constituency today. And we have four quadrants that we're really concentrating on with house museums. The first one is the physicality of the environment, the tactility of the environment. And that's what's so great about hearing about these sensory rooms. Um, communication, how this narrative is conveyed. And the final quadrant is how we engage the community. Now, all these things may seem very basic, but to us, it's very important to step back and think that we're not only thinking about people with disabilities, we're thinking about the rest of the world. So this is really a holistic assessment of what it means to be a historic house museum. And now, this is a really powerful thing. 34% of all historic house museums, this is an extrapolation, can you even get into the first floor? Most historic house museums, you can't even get into the first floor. And guess how many you can even get to the second floor? Now, again, this is an extrapolation. I actually think this is probably a high number. So there are some very basic architectural problems that I know all of us deal with, but because these homes are usually very small, and just imagine if you had a relative who had to move in who had a disability, the changes you'd have to make a lot of people will turn a living room into a bedroom because they can't get someone to the second floor. We're dealing with exactly the same issues. Um, now, all of our homes are owned by the city of New York, and I just want to say that with the Parks Department um, and the city's um, um, help, these houses are slowly becoming more accessible at least to the first floor. And so these are just some signs of the ramps that take you in um, to our houses. Um, as part of a, a kind of investigation of communication methods, um, this is one student project who was looking at Van Cortlandt House, and they're looking at site-specific sound installations um, for people who can't see things. Um, and so uh, what it does is allow people to hear what the furniture would sound like if it's used. Um, this is just one example, taking an iPod and putting it in the room doing that. Um, another one is how you walk through the house. 
I mean, many cases, it's very difficult to walk through the house the way the house would have normally been used. It becomes even more difficult when we talk about issues of access. This was a student project in the upper left, and he actually tracked how he walked through his apartment. This is our goal, and this is our goal for everyone. And when you go to a historic house museum, you most likely will not go through it like this. And we're suggesting this perhaps is the way it should be. Um, also, tactile interactions. In most cases, you can't touch anything. You can't sit on anything. You actually can't go up and open a book. You can't open a drawer. Um, one of the things that we're very interested in is not only for the larger community, but in ways that really work with co cognitively impaired um, constituents, how they can start to interact tactfully with the house. Now, community engagement. We're really interested in new methodology of engaging communities. We've talk, heard a lot about that. And historic house museums traditionally have a very narrow sense of what their community is, partially because who can come to the house, partially because the communication methods. Um, and what we're trying to do is push social media, new advisory committees, and new ways of operating that would engage constituents that never would have considered coming to a historic house museum. And so once again, I'm just showing you this kind of path, and I apologize for going so quickly, but this is a rather large project um, that we're undertaking. Um, but we've started with just assessments of our houses, moving with public presentations into teaching at multiple universities and schools nationally, to also being on the web, asking for peer discourse on LinkedIn and through other discussion groups. And now we're about to move on pilot programs, investigating what it means really to be an anarchist with historic house museums and how this new anarchist view can really embrace, and I was so happy to hear this notion of, of we want everybody. Um, the point here is we really do want everyone. Um, we may not know how to do that. So I guess I'm kind of here to say we're learning. They've asked us to be here to show you that we're one of the ones that are learning and in the process of doing that. Thank you. Thank you. We, I, I want to highlight the fact that the panelists are um, from very diverse cultural organizations in very different positions, <laughs> right? And I think that this is something that I kind of want to, want to underscore because um, we, you know, talked about at the very beginning, um, Glenn Lowry speaking about the fact that access needs to be an institutional priority. It is not the sole purview of one department. So it's not only in education, or it's not only in human resources, or it's not only the executive director who's going to be <laughs> thinking about this. Um, that it really needs to be a cross-institutional effort for it to be successful and for it to be sustainable. We have time maybe for one very quick question. <laughs> How about in the green in the back? Thank you. And then we have a surprise for you. Donuts? <laughs> <laughs> I would have given you donuts if the Knicks had won. Aaron I agree and with that. Donuts, Go Knicks. Right? Yeah. Hi, Frank. Uh, Cheryl Rosario, um, Director of Philanthropy at American Express, focused on primarily historic preservation and arts and culture, and I'm also a vice chair on the board of directors at uh, Art Beyond Sight. Um, so in talking to a lot of the grantees that we fund under historic preservation, many of them are looking at the option now of virtual tours if uh, people with disabilities cannot get in the buildings. I think that's a nice addition, but personally, I still don't think that's uh, pushing the envelope not enough, and we do need to find ways to get to the second floor. Um, so I'm just curious what your thoughts are on these virtual tours, and are you seeing that as well as sort of the uh, way to, I don't want to say to get around this, but to, to address this? I will say that, of course, virtual tours are, are 
other than money, they're the, you can do those. And they, they're really wonderful. But again, they're not even just for people with disabilities who can't get to the second floor. But I hope what you'd understand from the Anarchist Guide um, kind of thoughts is that ultimately it's tactile. Like, I really wanted to touch her coat here because it's really soft up here, this purple. Um, it, that really matters. And sensing that space and what it's like to sit in there, I think that for us, for historic house museums, is the kind of quality that is so magnificent about these small cultural organizations. So we will do everything we can to have both, but I really do feel like the tactility of getting inside and being there is really valuable.